So we have discussed up to this point in the last class. Uh, the corresponding characteristics, transfer characteristics of uh, this half wave rectifier, we have seen last day what happens whenever the diode is not an ideal one. If the diode is uh, following some uh, constant voltage model, then this should be your uh, transfer characteristics of uh, that particular circuit. Right. And we have also calculated the, the peak inverse voltage experienced by the diode, and that value was given by peak of the input voltage. So if the peak is at, say, here it, is, it has been represented by Vs, so if the peak is at uh, Vs, uh, then the diode withstands or diode experiences a maximum reverse voltage equal to Vs. Even if we just uh, assume the constant voltage model. Now today, we will just extend this concept to uh, the full wave rectifier with center type transformer. And as you know, now here what we have, you have two diodes, D1 and D2, and I am assuming that both of these two diodes are following the constant voltage model and they have the same cutting voltage equal to Vd. Okay. So this is 1 is to 2. Forget about that. Doesn't matter. Whether the translation is 1 is to 2 or 1 is to 1 doesn't matter. The main thing is that this uh, this point is grounded, center tap, so this is grounded, this is added to the ground terminal. Now, whenever this is experiencing some voltage, something like that, then this terminal will experience this kind of voltage. Now, if this peak is at Vm, then this is at minus Vm. Right? If it is at Vm, if this one is plus Vm, this should be minus Vm. Right? And this, this point is connected to ground. Okay? Actually, in this representation, it has been represented by V of S, hopefully. Yeah, it's V of S. V of S to minus V of S, something like that. Anyhow, forget about that. Yes. So now, uh, if your uh, input voltage, so now this point is connected to uh, a ground terminal. Now, whenever your input voltage is greater than Vd, that means whenever at this particular point, if this potential is greater than Vd, I'm assuming that, okay, Vm should be greater than Vd, but uh, that peak is greater than Vd, Vd. Now, when your input voltage is greater than Vd, then this diode D1 will conduct, Right? Yes. And uh, then your output voltage V out is given by that. Uh, last we have also uh, we have done this exercise. V out is given by uh, your input voltage V in minus V D. Okay. So this is so. If you now draw this particular, uh, I mean, if you just want to represent this uh, equation by means of some uh, straight line, so obviously. Uh, it is something like that. This is a straight line. V out is equal to V in minus Vd. Whenever your input voltage is greater than or equal to Vd. If not, if your input is less than Vd but greater than 0. Greater than 0 but less than Vd. That means you are in this particular region. This diode T1 will be off. If the diode T1 is off, that means there is no connection from this terminal to this terminal. So it is acting as a open switch. Okay? So therefore, what do you expect? Open switch means no current. So no current means this terminal and this terminal, they are having the same potential. No current is flowing through this resistance. So obviously, the output voltage is equal to zero. Now what happens in the negative half cycle? Negative half cycle, as long as your input voltage, mod of the input voltage, negative half cycle, the input should be negative. The negative half cycle, the input should be negative. Okay. Now, if the mod value of that is less than Vd, this diode will be off. Okay. And when the mod value of your input voltage is greater than Vd, this diode will be on. Right? This diode will be on. And once again, uh, if you can represent this V out is equal to V in minus Vd. But remember, that time V in is actually negative. Right? That time V in is actually negative. So, you have this kind of uh, representation over there. Sir, why is the slope approximately equal to 1? Yes, very good question. The question is that why the slope is approximately equal to 1, why is not exactly equal to 1? Now, uh, if I assume that, okay, this is a constant voltage model, you know, in that case, what I can write over there, uh, over here, 
uh, these diode can be presented. These diode can be presented by means of this this particular voltage source, and obviously, with that, you have some resistance. Right. So that is the more generic representation of the diode. You have a voltage source, the VD on, along with some series resistance, RD on, RD on. Now, in this particular case, constant voltage model, we have assumed that, okay, that R on part is zero. We are just considering, okay, some VD on is there, so that it follows the constant voltage model. Then only you can have uh, this kind of slope, then only you can represent this V out as V in minus V. Otherwise, what you should write, V out is given by V in minus V D minus some, the current that is flowing through this, let it be I D times R D on. And remember, this I D, this I D, this current which is flowing through this diode is not a linear function of the applied voltage. It follows some exponential nature, right? But if you just forget about that that part, if I assume that okay, this R T on is uh, exactly equal to zero, then you can assume that this V out is equal to V in minus V in. In that case, the slope will be exactly equal to one. Now the output is positive, either in uh, either in the first half or in the second half. That means either in the positive half cycle or in the negative half cycle, right? Now, in the positive half cycle, what happens? Both the input and as well as the output, both of them are positive. So that's why the slope is positive. Slope is equal to one. Now, what happens in negative half cycle? In the negative half cycle, the input is negative. Input is negative. Yes. Right? Input is negative, but input is negative, but the output is positive. So that's why the slope is equal to minus one. Okay. Now that you already know uh, from your basic understanding. Now, what about the, the corresponding peak inverse voltage? You have already seen that uh, using your center tap transformer, the peak inverse voltage expressed by each of these diodes, uh, that, that value was equal to twice of here, right? Twice of here. Now, uh, that was the scenario with an ideal ideal diode. Now, what happens with 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 a, with a practical diode with uh, a PD on is equal to uh, non-zero, right? Now, what happens with that? Minus Try to understand first uh, whether uh, you can uh, understand this nature or not. Can you understand this nature? Input is something like that. Sinusoidal signal, Vm sin omega t or Vs sin omega t. And this output is represented by this blue. Now whenever your input is greater than Vd, the positive half cycle, when the input is greater than Vd, then the diode E1 will conduct. And the negative half cycle, when the input is less than minus V. In the positive half cycle, when the input is greater than VD, then the output, I mean the diode T1 will be on. And in the negative half cycle, when the input is less than minus VD. Or in other words, you can say that in both the two half cycles, if the input mod of the input is greater than VD, then the either of the diodes will be on. Either D1 is on or D2 is on. Okay. And obviously, whenever the input achieves its peak at uh, over here, it is represented by V of S. Then what should be your output? This output is nothing but V of S minus the diode drop. One diode drop. This Vs minus V. This peak is represented by this peak is not, not equal to Vs. Rather, there is a drop, and that drop is equal to Vd. Vs minus Vd. Okay. Now, how to find out this peak inverse voltage? Now, while calculating the peak inverse voltage, suppose the diode V2 is under your consideration, right? Now, if diode D2 is under your consideration, then you have to uh, consider the positive half, cycle. positive half cycle. Now, what happens in the positive half cycle? In the positive half cycle, whenever you are over here, that means input is at its positive peak, then this diode D2 will experience the maximum reverse voltage. Right? So, over here, when this is the representation of, uh, let, let me call let me call uh, this point as point A and this point as point B. So this is the representation, I mean this farm line, this is the representation of, let me do one thing. Yes, so 
if this is point A, this is point B. So this farm line is nothing but the voltage addition at point A and this dotted line is the voltage addition at point B. Okay. Now, whenever you are over here, you are over here, then this diode D2 is experiencing the maximum reverse voltage. Because at the cathode terminal, what do you expect? The cathode terminal, it is having whatever the voltage over there. This voltage is nothing but that, that peak, that peak, peak of the output because this terminal is connected to the output node. Isn't it sorted now? This one. So what is that potential over here, over here at uh, omega t is equal to pi by 2. What is that value? Vs minus, minus Vd. Right, so cathode terminal, so cathode potential V of k for diode D2 at omega t is equal to pi by 2 that is equal to V of s minus V of D, Vd. Yes, right, and what about the anode potential minus at, of, at D2 when omega t is equal to <laughs> pi by 2? That value is given by minus Vs. That value is given by minus V of S. Right? So therefore, what is the peak inverse voltage? This peak inverse <coughs> voltage is nothing but 2 Vs minus, minus V. 2 Vs minus V. So you have seen last day that if the diode, all the diodes are ideal, then the peak inverse voltage is given by twice of the maximum voltage. Now if the diodes are not ideal, if they have some uh, non idealities in, in their nature, represented by the corresponding uh, 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 this diode voltage, I mean internal voltage VD on, then uh, the, uh, ultimately the peak inverse voltage gets modified for this uh, set of uh, full wave rectifier, not for the half wave things. Half wave things are still uh, V of this or D of P or D of M, whatever you say, that is the peak, peak output. Okay. Is it clear up to this? Okay. <coughs> now this has been illustrated even more lucidly in this slide. Now Amita was asking whether it is a 1 is to 1 or 1 is to 2 out of the trans ratio, right? Now here you see. Hopefully it can be observed from the from the last bench as well. Now suppose uh, the transition one is to one. Okay. So here what you have VP primary to minus VP primary. Right. Now it is one is to one. If the trans ratio of the transfer is one is to one, then ultimately you understand that over here if you just uh, try to find out the difference between this point and this point, the difference in voltage. That is once again, that difference is over here at omega t is equal to pi by 2, that difference equal to Vp prime, prime. That means since this is grounded, center tap transformer, so since this is grounded, so with respect to ground, this potential is Vp primary by 2 and this potential is Vp minus Vp primary by 2 at omega t is equal to pi by 2. This corresponds to omega t is equal to pi by 2, this corresponds to omega t is equal to pi, this corresponds to omega t is equal to 3 pi by 2, this corresponds to omega t is equal to 2 pi. So at omega t is equal to pi by 2, this input is Vp primary. Now since it's 1 is to 1, so at omega t is a pi by 2, the difference between this node, this, this potential and that potential, that is also equal to Vp primary. Now since this is grounded, so this is Vp primary by 2, this is minus V primary by 2. Similarly, at omega t is equal to 3 pi by 2, over here, this is minus V primary. So the difference between this terminal, the voltage between this terminal and this terminal is equal to minus V primary only. Okay? That means if this is minus V primary by 2, this should be plus V primary by 2. So the difference is minus V primary. Why so? Because it's a 1 is to 1. Okay, now if this is V primary by 2 over there, during the positive half cycle, at omega t is equal to pi by 2, this peak is at omega Vp primary by 2. Obviously, in the positive half cycle, this diode D2 will be off. Okay, 
So what about your output voltage? This output voltage is given by Vp primary by 2 over there <coughs> minus you have a drop. Now let us assume that it's a silicon wire with a drop equal to 0 0.7 volt. Okay. So put over here is Vp primary by 2 minus 0 0.7. The peak is obtained at omega t is equal to pi by 2. Okay. Hmm. Same thing. Sir, that that voltage difference and that voltage difference, these two are the same. Okay. And over here it is 1 is to 2. Over here you find that it is 1 is to 2. That means a step up transformer. Actually, what you use in the lab, you use a kind of step down transformer. Whenever you are using or you are uh, suppose uh, you are doing some experiment uh, for uh, for your uh, regulator power supply. There is an experiment I, I believe in your instrumentation workshop. There is an ex experiment that you have to uh, fabricate one uh, uh, regulated yeah regulator power supply. So for that, what you require you you, you don't require a uh, step up transformer because already the power you know that two gear supply is there. So uh, you have to reduce the voltage level, right? So that time you don't require this step up transformer, you require a step down transformer. But for illustration, in this particular slide has been shown that had this been a step up transformer with uh, with a 1 is to 2 uh, trans ratio, then if this difference between this terminal and this terminal, if this difference is equal to VP primary, right? And since if it is 1 is to 2, then over here at uh, omega t is equal to pi by 2, that difference will be twice VP primary. Okay? Now since this is already grounded, so this is VP primary, this will be minus VP primary. So the difference is twice V prime. Suppose this is a 10 volt plus minus, plus 10 volt minus 10 volt. You have 1 is to 2. So at omega t is equal to pi by 2, you expect that this difference is 20. Right. So once again, what you have is V primary, minus V primary, here minus V primary, plus V primary. Now we are representing in terms of output voltage. Either so it is better always whenever you represent the peak inverse voltage, it, it is it will be better to represent the peak inverse voltage in terms of your output voltage. In terms of your output voltage. Okay. So here what I get the output voltage is given by so what is your peak inverse voltage in this case? The peak inverse voltage for the first one, the peak inverse voltage is how much? VP primary minus 0.7. VP primary minus 0 0.7, right? Now, what is your output? V out. So, V out is given by VP primary by 2. I mean, I should write V out maximum, right? Minus 0 0.7. I should write like V out peak. V out peak. So now what you can do is you can represent this VP primary in terms of V out P. In terms of V out P. So what is that? So this is nothing but uh, if you just uh, add them, then VP primary is equal to 2 V out P plus 1.4. Right? Then ultimately, your peak inverse voltage becomes twice V out peak or VP out minus, sorry, plus 0 0.7. So it depends in which way you would like to represent. In terms of output voltage, it is given by 2 VP out and uh, peak output voltage, twice of the peak output voltage plus 0 0.7 volt. Or you can also represent in terms of the VP primary by 2. Then it is nothing but V primary 2 minus 0. Okay? So it is better to represent in terms of the output voltage. Right? So output is in terms of output voltage. Now you find that it is nothing but twice of V out peak plus 0. 0.7. Okay? For 2 is to 1 case, uh, if it is VP primary by minus V primary, then obviously that difference will be 
it is prime by, by 2. So it is prime by 4 and minus, minus of that. Okay. Okay, now let's move to, sorry. Now let's move to. Okay. There is another representation over there. Now that representation in terms of the secondary output voltage. Forget about the primary. Now in this particular case, there is no representation in terms of the primary. Last case, what we have, all the representation was made in terms of the primary. And some uh, trans ratio was given, 1 is to 1, 1 is to 2. Now here, nothing else is mentioned. You are free to select anything. Nothing is mentioned regarding the trans ratio. The only thing that you know is that, that difference between this terminal and this terminal, that difference is equal to VP secondary. Okay, so suppose VP secondary by 2 over here, and omega is pi by 2. So if that voltage is, is equal to VP secondary by 2, and you should have a 0.7 volt drop over there, so that voltage is nothing but VP secondary by 2 minus, minus 0.7. So that is a peak output, VP out, peak output voltage. Okay. Now at omega is equal to pi by 2, so that means whenever here, sorry, so whenever you want to hold here, suppose, so whenever you are over here, omega is equal to pi by 2, that means this diode D2 will experience the maximum reverse voltage. So anode will experience maximum negative voltage and cathode will experience maximum positive voltage. So what is the maximum negative voltage experienced by this uh, anode? At omega is equal to pi by 2, this is nothing but minus zero secondary by 2. And what about this cathode potential? This is nothing but this voltage. <coughs> yes. That's what it. What is that voltage? Zero secondary by 2 minus 0 0.7. Now if you just find out the difference, this difference will give you that PIP. Now, if you just take a look at this expression, so you can represent PIV either in terms of your secondary voltage, that means the voltage which has been developed over there, or in terms of the output voltage. It is customary to represent in terms of the output voltage. Right. So here PIV is represented by VP secondary minus 0 0.7. And here, I mean the same expression. Now here it has been represented by 2 VP out plus 0 0.7. I have just now calculated that thing, then how it is coming like 2 VP out plus 0 0.7. So today what we, are, what we are trying is that we are trying to emphasize the impact of the non-idealities resulting from the diode. If the diodes are not ideal, if they have some, uh, I mean, video on, non-zero video on, then what will be the corresponding impact on the PID? Obviously this twice you are that part is still there. Right, because transformer. <laughs> now what happens using a bridge rectifier? Now for bridge rectifier, as you know, <laughs> for bridge rectifier, you have four darts, two darts will be on in any particular half cycle. In the positive half cycle, suppose um, in the first, first graph and the first uh, structure, uh, first uh, circuit is for ideal diode. We have already explained this one in last class. Ideal diode, that means there is no drop across the diodes. The conduction angle is 180 degree. So here in the positive half cycle, diode D1 will be on, diode D2 will be on. Okay. What about the uh, peak uh, inverse voltage experienced by this diode D3 or diode D4? You know that this anode terminal is connected to the ground terminal, ground. What about the cathode? Cathode is nothing but your output potential because this is ground, this is connected. This is shorted, zero volt drop, this is shorted, so this cathode potential is nothing but the output. So here you find that PIV under ideal scenario, PIV under ideal scenario is given by only VP out. Unlike last case, last case what we have, we have 2 VP out plus 0 0.7, isn't it? We are observing in terms of VP out only. Last case what we have got, last time, it was like 2 VP out plus 0 0.7. Now, if I use this bridge rectifier, then we find that this PIV is given by 
two VP out only. If the all the darts are ideal. The darts are ideal, it is simply two VP out. Okay? Sorry, it, it is VP out. It is VP out. For two VP out, that was the case with uh, a center tap uh, full wave rectifier. But using bridge rectifier, it is only VP out. If the darts are ideal, if the darts are not ideal, then what happens? If they are minus minus seven. Okay. If the rights are not ideal, you understand that if this is your right now, if the rights are not ideal, then you understand that there is a 0 0.7 volt drop plus minus plus minus. Okay, so what about this potential over there in terms of VP out? What is this potential? No, it's not VP out. Minus, minus, plus, 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 minus or plus? Plus, plus, plus. 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 This one I did, no? Plus, minus, plus, minus. This one I did. So, VP out plus 0.7. That is the cathode potential. What is the anode potential? That is same zero ground. Okay, so what will PIV? VP out plus 0.7. VP out plus 0.7. So, if the diets are non ideal, then it is VP out plus 0.7. With bridge rectifier and with center tap full wave rectifier, it was 2 VP out plus 0.7. So that 0.7 part is still there and that is coming because of the diode's non ideality. Right. But we can get rid of this 2 part. Suppose you have VP out, suppose you would like to have an output voltage plus 10 to minus 10. Right. So in one case, you will be getting like 10.7, in the other case, you will get like 20.7. Right. We are looking for 10.7 obviously. Why? <coughs> because if the PIV is 10.7, then you can have an output voltage that can go up to 10 <coughs> or 9.3, whatever. Right. Using this particular uh, bridge rectifier. But if I use the same, suppose your PIV rating, say, say for example, suppose I am having a diode with PIV rating as mentioned in your <laughs> manufacturer data sheet, suppose PIV rating is given by, suppose it is say 12 volt for example. And if it is 12 volt and suppose the diodes, I mean uh, all the diodes are ideal, if it is 12 volt, then using bridge rectifier, you can have an output voltage which can go up to plus 12 to minus 12. It's possible. But if the if I employ the same diode with PI rating say 12 volt in the center tap transformer, plus then I can have plus 20 volt and minus 20. No, no not at all. Plus, plus 6 and minus 6. Plus, plus 6 and minus because you know that that PIV is equated to twice of VP out. Because you know that this is my this is a fixed quantity, 12 volt is fixed quantity. So that is equal to twice VP out for FWR with center tap transformer. And that 12 volt is equated to VP out for bridge rectifier. So accordingly from that, because you know that we are using the same diode. We have procured the diode from market and suppose the, uh, the data sheet says that it is 12 volt. It cannot withstand anything greater than 12 volt. That is the rating of the diode. So at max you can have that value is equal to twice VP out for your uh, FWR CT and that will equal to VP out with bridge rectifier. So for if I have the same diode with uh, with a PIV rating say 12 volt then you can amplify or you can have an output voltage to go from plus 6 to minus 6 at max in case of full wave rectifier to center to transformer. However, using the same diode, you can uh, have a rectification, full of rectification of 12 volt plus 12 minus 12 using bridge rectifier. The only negative thing is that in case of bridge rectifier, you have to use four diodes. That is the only disadvantage because nothing is obtained at pure cost, as you know. Right. You would like to reduce the ripple improve the form factor, improve the ripple factor, enhance the average voltage, DC voltage from as compared to the half wave rectifiers 
at the same time, you'd like to have the same uh, PI identity that you have got using your half wave rectifier. Everything is fine as far as those parameters are concerned, but at the cost of something, at the cost of using more time. That means you should have a more power loss over there also. More time means more power loss. <laughs> right. So you can say that it's not a cost effective solution. But still, even if you use uh, this uh, full wave rectifier or bridge rectifier, but you know that once again, the output that you are getting over there, this output is uh, something like this. Like this, no? What you are aiming for? You are aiming for a constant DC level. Because our, our ultimate goal is to design one uh, regulated power supply. So for the power supply, as you know, even if the time changes, suppose this is my T and this is my voltage axis, I should expect that this should be my desired level output. Are you getting this? No, no, are you getting using a rectifier? Full wave rectifier, V rectifier? No. You have fluctuations. You have fluctuations, so you have some ripple content. And you have calculated last day around 0.48, something like that. So only using this bridge rectifier, it is called that, okay, unidirectional signal. You have like uh, the input side, you have a variation, something like that. So negative part, last day I mentioned that something negative, you'd like to rectify, you'd like to modify. Something is negative, make it positive. This much you can do using rectifier. If something is negative, then make it positive. But still you know that that output waveform that you are getting, this contains two defined con components. One is the, the DC level, plus you have the ripple content. And from the notion of frequency, here you have the two types of signals. The DC level, as you know, the DC level is having a frequency content equal to <coughs> zero. This means that there's a constant level. There is no, no change in the, I mean, if, if you just observe this over a wider range from say, from this point to say, T is equal to infinity, you'll see that there is no change in the voltage level. So the frequency content or frequency component of the DC signal is equal to zero, zero hertz. Apart from that, you have some ripple content as well. Now, right at this point, let me just ask you one question. Suppose the input signal that you would like to uh, rectify, suppose the input signal, this frequency is given by 50 hertz, the line frequency, okay? Now, what about the, the frequency of the output for a half wave rectifier? For a half wave rectifier, what will be the frequency of this output? If the input is having a frequency of 50 hertz, and a sort of signal, what will be the frequency of the output waveform for a half wave rectifier? If this is my input, right? So for half wave rectifier, this is my output, and if this is my input for a full wave rectifier, this is my output, right? I am saying that this frequency, this input frequency is 50 hertz. For half wave, what is the frequency? 50 hertz. 50 hertz for half wave, right? And for full wave? 100 hertz. 100 hertz. <laughs> What's my point? Yes. Any doubt, any confusion? Yes, I did too. Input signal is having a frequency of 50 hertz. That means what? If I observe this waveform, if I observe this waveform over a, a span of say one second, right? There are 50 such cycles. 50 cycles in one second. 50 hertz. Okay. Over here, the nature is different. Nature is not sinus or pure sinus or But if I observe the, the pattern, so this pattern is the same, no? So in one second, one second you have uh, this entire thing. So here this is my pattern, plus minus, and here this is my pattern, plus zero. So this pattern will be repeated one second, fifty times in a second. So fifty hertz. 
Now over here, this pattern gets repeated multiple times, twice. <coughs> so if this happens uh, 50 times in a single second, so this happens 100 times. In a second. Is it clear? Anybody having any doubt? No. Okay. Then let's do one thing. Now let's change the type of input. Let's change the type of input and let me ask that, that question, frame this question. And this question is one of the questions that I have uh, framed, uh, set up in uh, some of the previous semester examinations. The question is, okay, <coughs> the input, sorry. This is a rectangular, a square you can say, plus and minus both. Zero, third. This is zero, this is t, this is say plus one volt, this is say minus one volt. Okay, this is my input signal, right? This is my input. Now I am feeding this input to a half wave rectifier and suppose uh, the frequency is given by 50 hertz. Okay, now I am feeding this to a half wave rectifier. Assuming that all the dice are ideal. Yes. Half a rectifier. <coughs> what will be the output frequency? 50 hertz. 50 hertz. Now the catch. Yes. This is my input. This is my input. I feed it to a bridge rectifier or full wave, whatever it may be. Ideal that. What will be the output? What is the output? I mean, what is the frequency? Two words. What is the frequency? Zero. 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 Very Zero. So, every time, now if you just remember, now, if you just remember, okay, for half wave rectifier, the output frequency and input frequency are same. And for full wave rectifier, the output frequency is nothing but the twice of the input frequency. Now, if you remember that formula, no? <laughs> so that formula is valid only for a type of signal. So whenever I have framed that question in a semester examination, I have seen that more than 60 or 70 percent of the students, your seniors, they have answered that. If, if input is 50 or the output is 100. Because every time you have this notion that, okay, for uh, the full of rectified, the frequency gets up. But you have to think, what have input you applying? This is true for a sinusoidal signal. This might not be the case for a, a rectangular pulse. <coughs> Can you get my point? Yes, if it is ideal, so this part and this part. This part and this part. So ultimately what you expect. <laughs> So it looks something like that, no? I will continue. This plus this. It will continue. It's not that hundred hertz. But if you follow that 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 theorem or that, that, that thing that okay, the for output time it will it will be doubled for a bridge rectifier or pull rectifier. Then you land up to some wrong uh, concept or wrong result, wrong answer. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Okay. But still, we are not. There, is, there are some ripples. There are some because you don't expect this type of input over there. For illustration only, I have just explained this. You don't expect this type of input because typically what you get from the supply line. The input is something like sinusoidal signal. And from this sinusoidal signal, I have to generate that, that DC. Right? So, something has to be done. 
Now, as I already mentioned, that your output, so if I consider this is my output, this is my output. So it contains two different things. One is the DC level, BDC, plus some ripple content, right? That DC level is having some zero frequency, constant DC, so no change in frequency, zero frequency. And that ripple part is having some non-zero frequency. Yes. Right. So what is, I, what is my objective? My objective is to get rid of those ripples. I have to eliminate those ripples from the output. How can I do that? What could have been the possible uh, circuit elimination that I should use so that those possible ripples, I mean the, the present uh, ripples present over there, that can be eliminated to some extent, not exactly or not completely, but to some extent I can reduce this. Why are you saying capacitor? First of all, the question is that I have to eliminate those things, right? So I have to generate something, I have to devise something which can eliminate those variations. And those variations are basically high frequency variations with respect to my DC frequency. Because DC frequency is zero frequency. So I have to keep that, because that is my desired signal. Ultimately my goal is to generate one regulated power supply. So that's a constant thing, DC. So in my output I am having two components. Some DC plus some unwanted ripples. Which is having higher frequency as compared to DC. Right, so I have to develop something, some circuit, which can eliminate those high frequency contents. That means I have to devise some. Now, technical, I'd like to mention that that uh, uh, that uh, circuit is known as a filter circuit. You have to you have to filter out those uh, high frequency content. So, what kind of filter it should be? No, no. What kind of filter? I have to eliminate those high frequency contents. That means it should pass the low frequency. I have to eliminate the high frequency with because DC is my DC is my desired frequency, zero hertz, and having some uh, non-zero hertz uh, frequency in the uh, ripple content. So I have to eliminate those high frequency, or rather, in other words, I, I have to retain those low frequency. Right? I have to retain those low frequencies. So I have to keep those low frequencies. It will pass only low frequencies. It's a low pass filter. Right. It will pass only the low frequency contents, not those high frequency contents. Can we get the point? Then the next question is that how to do that? Because hopefully I've got those, uh, I mean, uh, those materials and everything. So that's why you're saying that, okay, capacitor, inductor, and all these things. So first of all, you have to Think that what should I use in a block diagram level, in a black box level, what should I use and why should I use? First, what and why and then how? That should be the, I mean, that should be the pattern of thinking. What, why and then comes how? My idea is to retain those low frequency content, that DC frequency, and I have to eliminate those high frequency content. So high frequency component should be eliminated from my output. In other words, I have to keep the low frequency components. That can be achieved by using a filter, because you understand what is meant by filter. I have to keep those low frequency components. I mean, so those filters will only pass the low frequency component. It's a low pass filter. Now to start with, you can uh, achieve this. I pass. Now to start with, so far what you have seen, you have seen this is my circuit. You have a diode, you have a register over there. Or a simple uh, half wave rectifier. What do you have? You have a simple diode, D1 over there and one resistance over there. As simple as that. Now, whenever it comes to the elimination of some frequency contents and so, you know that this resistance kind of thing, 
which is insensitive to the frequency operation because every time it obeys the ohms law. Resistance is not a function of frequency. R is so 1 kilo ohms. If you measure at say 500 hertz, it is, it is 1 kilo ohms. If you measure it at 50 hertz, one second it is 1 kilo ohms. <laughs> so you have to use some frequency selective, frequency sensitive element. Now to start with, suppose I have used one a capacitor over there. Now let us check what happens. If I use this capacitor, what happens? I don't know whether this will serve my purpose or not, or completely or not. Now, suppose we have some, now to uh, discuss this particular thing. Now suppose uh, you have, a simple RC circuit like this. You have a C over there, you have a R over there, and suppose this is my input. Let this be some V. Okay. Now I am not going into the mathematical part because hopefully that will be covered. Hopefully it has been already been covered in your basic electrical course. If not, it should be covered in your circuit theory. Simple RC circuit. I am having some say uh, DC signal present over there, and let's assume that and this so output should be obtained from this terminal. So this is my output terminal. Okay, V out. Now, obviously, the current which is flowing through this, through this network, this current, will it vary with respect to time? What do you feel? Will it vary? Yes, this capacity should vary. And suppose, initially the whole time, is, suppose initially the capacity is not completely discharged. Some initial charge. And accordingly, some initial voltage across the capacitor, suppose this is present, some V initial. That is initial voltage. Okay, so the initial voltage, let me call it V initial, V I N, V initial voltage. So this output voltage, what you can write over there, this output voltage, V out, so for this circuit, you have V over there. See, this is my V out. Ah. So if you just apply the corresponding KVL over there, you know the current through this uh, resistance, nothing but, uh, I mean, if I consider the voltage drop across resistance VR, and you know this capacitor, if I consider that particular voltage, Q is equal to C into V. So the current I, that is dQ dt, that is equal to C dV dt. So from that uh, entire thing, you can find out what should be my expression for the output voltage across this capacitor. So this output voltage, I am just writing it down. The final expression, which is nothing but or let it be say, if I call it say V final, and this capacitor is having some initial voltage, that is V initial. The capacitor is not completely discharged at T is equal to zero, whenever you have just turned on this circuit, at T is equal to zero, it is not completely discharged, it is having some voltage, residual voltage across its terminals, that is a V out, and that voltage is equal to say V initial, V in. So then, this output voltage is given by V final plus V initial minus V final into e to the power minus T by R C. That is the expression. You will be getting that expression. I am not going into the mathematical part. V out as a function of time is given by V final plus V initial minus V final into the power minus T by R. So you can also verify this expression. If you put T is equal to 0, at T is equal to 0, what happens? At T is equal to 0, this entire thing will become 1. Right? So V final plus V initial minus V final. So in, at T is equal to 0, the volt, I mean the output voltage is equal to V initial. 
right? And when the T value is very large, with respect to this RC, RC is known as a time constant. If T is very large, then this e to the power minus T by RC that is becoming very small, and when it is approaching towards zero, right? So this this second term will vanish, and ultimately you are left with a V finite. Okay. So initial value is V initial V I N T initial output voltage. I mean, the, whenever you have just turned on the circuit, the initial output voltage is given by V I N T, and the final output voltage that we are looking for is V final. So ultimately, the capacitor will be charged up to this point. Suppose initially the voltage across uh, across this uh, uh, this output terminal I mean output voltage, the voltage across the terminal of the capacitor, the initial voltage suppose that one is less than this V final. Now you are charging this one. You are charging this capacitor using this particular battery, the final. It will charge up to that particular point. I mean, the final takes certain amount of time, and that time is known as this time constant. This constant is very large. It will take longer time to get charged. And if the time constant is small, then it will take shorter time. Okay. Now. Now, now we try to reciprocate this particular circuit with this one. Is there any any similarity? Can you find out any similarity between the circuit that I have drawn, a simple RC circuit, with this one, the upper circuit? Forget about this RL for the time. Forget about this RL for the time. The charging path. You just try to understand what happens during charging. You have some resistance over there, right? You have some resistance. But remember, if I assume that okay, the diode is I, is not an ideal one, so the diode, so the diode can be represented. So if the diode is not an ideal one, so the diode can be represented as a battery with some resistance, plus minus with some resistance R D on. And remember that R T on when the diode is on, that resistance value is small enough. On resistance, the so ideal should be zero, but uh, practically few ohms. And you have some battery over there, present over there. If the diode is not ideal, I am assuming practical diode mode. Okay, practical diode mode. Then what should be the Peak output voltage over there. Initially, what happens? Initially, suppose uh, this output is, I mean, there is no uh, initial voltage that is equal to zero, for example. So, what, what should be the final targeted voltage? The voltage at which the capacitor might be charged. You have over here. You have some VD, right? And this one is a V final. Or uh, let me call it say VP. Uh, so the capacitor, so over here, the, this is the output terminal. So here you have plus, minus, plus, and then you have plus, minus. You have a drop, na? you have a drop, diode drop. So minus, plus, plus, minus. So VP minus VD. Suppose initially the capacitor, I mean uh, this output terminal, suppose initially uh, this voltage is equal to zero, completely discharged capacitor initially. Then what should be the final value, the targeted value at which the capacitor might be charged? Vp minus Vd on? Uh, Vd, Vp minus Vd. Right? Now, okay, fine, it will be charged up to this point. But the question is that, remember, it will be charged following this particular formula. Okay, V initial is equal to zero. That is fine. So if what you can write V final into one minus e to the power minus T by R C. That's right. Now the question is that what is that R and what is that C? So C is the same C that you are using over there, capacitor. What is that R? That R is basically the diode on resistance, and which is typically small in the forward bias regime. The forward bias regime, the diode resistance is typically small, right? So that RC time for that product, that product is small with respect to the time period. With respect to the time period, the product is small. What you can expect 
this e to the power minus t by rc, if rc is small with respect to the time period, right, t by rc, that term is large, that term is large, e to the power t by rc, that term is large, t, t by rc, that term is large, because rc is small, time constant is small, that means the capacitor will be charged very quickly. So, rc is small with respect to the time, so t by rc is large, and it, you have e to the power minus of that. So, this, this entire thing will be equal to 0. So, instantaneously the output voltage can reach to V final. Now, your V final can be, suppose your VD on is equal to, say it is 0 0.7 volt and suppose this VP is equal to say 5 volt. So, whenever the input voltage just exceeds 0 0.7 volt, the next value is say, okay, it's a, a continuous variation 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 and so on and so forth. So, whenever the input rises, instantaneously the capacitor can track this change, right. So, here if this is my input variation, the first one, so this will be my output variation over there. It can track it very quickly. But that's not a big deal. We have already seen that output voltage. Even if you don't have a capacitor, you have you know you have a resistor, then also it can have that, that uh, particular variation. We have just now seen, huh? Using half wave rectifier, full wave, we have seen all these things. So up to pi by two, up to pi by two, there is no difference. Already have seen that one. That okay? If I if I have this kind of thing, if my input goes something like that. Uh, then uh, the output is something like this. Up to this point, there is no such change. So, I have not discussed until this point. It will be confined from 0 to pi by 2 only. <laughs> So, I have not said anything beyond 5 by 2. Up to 5 by 2. So, the capacitor charge, so it will up to Vp minus. Vp minus Vd on, yes. But how can we show that in that time interval, capacitor will fully charged? It will be charged up to Vp minus Vd on. Yes, in that time interval. That I have to ensure that this RC time constant is small enough with respect to my time period. And why RC time constant is small enough? Because here I don't have any choice. Next we will see that the RC time, I require RC time constant to be large enough. Sometimes you require. Right. So I cannot play with C value because C will be used in both these two cases. So how can you be sure that the RC time constant is small enough during the, uh, the first quarter? That can be verified by using the, okay. That can be verified by uh, considering that uh, this one. So, that can be verified by assuming that this resistance value is small when the diode is in forward bias. So, if, even if I take some moderate value for the C, then this product R and C, that product is small enough with respect to the, the time period of the input signal. But already you have seen that even with, even if we do not use this capacitors, even if we use simple resistor using a half wave rectifier or full wave rectifier, after, I mean, in, in the first quarter, 0 to pi by 4, there is no such change, the same thing. Right. Now, if I have a resistor over there, then the corresponding change, if I have a resistor over there, then you know that this diode will remain on for the entire duration of the positive half cycle. Both for the half wave as well as for the full wave. The diode will remain on for the entire duration of the positive half cycle. Right. And remember this time, we have a capacitor, we don't have a resistor. Okay, we can have some resistor in, in parallel with this capacitor, but we have a resistor, we have a capacitor over there. Now, what happens beyond this point? <laughs> beyond this point, beyond this T1, beyond this omega t is equal to pi by 2, now what happens? Now, the anode potential over there, now it starts decreasing from its peak. If I have a peak over there, if I have a peak over there, then beyond omega t is equal to pi by 2, this anode potential starts decreasing. 
right what about the cathode potential capacity is charged capacity is charged up to vp minus vd on so that voltage is now that voltage is larger with respect to this voltage this will make the diode off this will make the diode off so from 0 to pi by 4 sorry 0 to pi by 2 the diode was on in this field circuit the diode was on in field circuit from 0 to pi by 2 the first quarter you have four quarters, two cycles, four quarters. Zero to pi by two, pi by two to pi, and then the rest. You have seen that in case of uh, your half wave rectifier, the diode will become on in the entire positive half cycle. If I have a simple resistor, but if I have a capacitor over there, then the diode will remain on until omega t is equal to pi by two. Beyond this point, what happens? The cathode potential is held at a higher value as compared to the anode potential. Or anode potential drops, cathode potential is kept at the higher value. This will make now the diode is no longer acting as this one. So far, the diode was acting like this. Now the diode is acting as an open switch, as an open switch. Now what happens? Now you have now this capacitor is having some initial voltage. What is that voltage? So that voltage is nothing but your VP minus VD on. Let me call that voltage to be, say, let it be, uh, say, that voltage, uh, let me call that voltage, say, uh, let it be, say, Vm, that is equal to Vp minus Vd on, okay. That is the maximum voltage across the capacitor, at t is equal to, omega t is equal to pi by 2. Now, this part, now what happens over here, now the diode becomes off, so this is an open switch. Now what happens now, this voltage is there, that is Vp minus Vd on or Vf. Now this voltage will get discharged to this transistor. Okay. Then what about the output voltage, what is the expression? I have already written one expression during the charging. This expression, the first expression is valid for charging. And this expression, now I am writing another expression. This is for discharging and that V out expression <laughs> is given by, if this is my uh, Vp minus Vd on, then this is nothing but Vm e to the power minus T by R. So that is during charging and that is during discharging. Okay. So now we are basically it seems that both of them are C, uh, R and C but remember this one not the same. Here what you have, you have basically the diode resistance RTC and here you have the load resistance RLC. These two resistance are different. And uh, suppose your diode resistance is a few tens of ohms, whereas the load resistance is suppose in that range of few kilo ohms. Order difference. Three order difference. Okay. Now comes, now you have Vm e to the minus T by RLC. The previous we leaving start G, that RTC product, this RC time constant was small enough with respect to the time. It was small enough. This time during discharging, I am using just the reverse concept. This time the charge, discharging time constant should be high enough. But you are using the same capacitor, so that's why I have told you few minutes back that uh, I cannot play with the capacitor time because the same capacitor will be used during charging as well as during this. I should have two different values of R, two different resistances. During charging, the resistance is, uh, I mean the corresponding resistance value is obtained from the diode part, RTC and during the discharging, it is from the external resistance that you are using, that is RTC. RTC. Yes, so during discharging what happens, this is your anode potential, so let me mark, this is your VA anode potential, right, and this one, this point is VK. 
right? So right at this point, at omega t is equal to phi by 2, and omega t, uh, t is just greater than t1, this anode potential, now you find, what about the voltage, anode potential, over there, this anode potential is Vp, and what about this voltage, this voltage is Vp minus Vd on, now as long as it is Vp minus Vd on, so this is Vp minus Vd on, and apart from that you have some difference, you should maintain our difference of Vd on, it is not an ideal term. Remember, it's a practical term. You should expect that this VA minus VD, uh, sorry, VA minus VK, you should ensure that this VA minus VK, that difference should be your VD on. Now, if this difference is less than VD on, then the uh, diode will be off. Right. Now, right at omega t is equal to pi by 2 or t is equal to t1, right at this point, that difference is simply Vd on. Okay? Now, if, if you consider time t is equal to t1 plus delta t, then what about this voltage? This voltage drops. And our voltage drops. So, the difference is now becoming less than Vd on. Now, if the difference is less than Vd on, that will trigger the diode to become off. Once it is off, diode will act as a as an open switch. Now the charging phenomenon will stop. Discharge. Now the capacitor will discharge through this register RL. What is the formula? Formula is Vm e to the power minus T by RLC. And that RL value is large with respect to the RD value. Suppose 3 order higher, 4 order higher. Okay. So, previously during charging, what we have assumed? We have assumed that e to the power minus t by RDC can be approximated to be equal to 0. Because RDC was very small with respect to t, so t by RDC was very large, e to the power minus something very large is approximated to 0. But this time it is just the reverse thing. This time, this time, what you can have, last time during charging, we assume it was e to the power minus x. And during charging, x was much, much greater than unity. During discharging, we have e to the power minus x. And x is much, much less than unity. Right. So, now e to the power minus x, if x is much, much less than unity, that can be approximate to only 1 minus x. The square root of terms, higher root terms, square root 3, 4, so all these higher root terms will be or can be neglected. So, this e to the power minus t by RLC can be simply represented by 1 minus t by RLC. That's it. It is no longer an exponential decay, that is a linear decay. Right, it is a linear decay. Once again, so, linearly it will fall. So, what happens? The cathode potential, you have e to the power minus, so uh, Vm e to the power minus t, t by RLC. So, during discharging, since the, uh, the charge across the capacitor will discharge through this particular resistor RL. So, and since RL is large, so this RLC product is large with respect to the time period. So, this T by RLC is small, much, much less than 1. So, then e to the power minus of x can be approximate to 1 minus x only. The square 3 fourths all these higher terms will be neglected and be neglected. So, although that exponential, I mean, uh, this variation is an exponential variation, but here uh, I am assuming that because of this approximation, that is a linear position. Okay? So, what happens? The cathode potential of, of this diode T1 drops linearly, something like that. Linearly. And you have this anode potential that is varying in its own <laughs> fashion, in own rhythm. It varies from 0 to Vm, Vp, Vp to 0, 0 to minus something, then coming back to 0 once again, and then starts rising. Then a point will come when this difference, VA, this voltage VA and this voltage VK, their difference once again greater than Vd on. 
So, cathode potential, I mean the output potential, reduces in a linear fashion, discharging, and the anode potential increases in its own rhythm. This is basically the sinusoidal signal that we are applying, input signal. 0 to Vm, Vm to 0, 0 to minus Vm, minus Vm to 0, then once again it rise, rises, right? Then, in the next half, I mean, third, so this discharging happens uh, starts at the first half cycle. Second half cycle, there is no question of charging because the input was negative, anode potential negative, cathode potential positive. There is no question of charging in the second half cycle. Third half cycle, when the anode potential now it now now what happens? Anode potential reduces. T is equal to T1 plus. From this point onwards, the anode potential reduces. Cathode potential also reduces, right? But and obviously in the in the second half cycle or in the negative half cycle, the anode potential is negative. There is no question of charging. In the third cycle, I mean in the next half cycle or second uh, positive half cycle, now the anode potential is becoming positive. Cathode potential is also positive, and that's why we have selected very large value of RL, right? So that the capacitor cannot discharge significantly. It can return its charge. Is there a diagonal RK that of kilo ohm or diagonal ohm? Tens of ohms. Let it be say 20 ohms or 50 ohms, something like that. Kilo ohms. So you have to select RL in that fashion. So that the discharging can be prevented to some extent. Then in the next half cycle at T is equal to T3. At T is equal to T2, what do you find? At T is equal to T2, these two voltages, anode voltage, cathode voltage, they are same. Right? Both of them are, so cathode voltage starts reducing from T is equal to T1 onwards. And anode voltage changes in its own rhythm. Here it is positive, but get less than Vk, it is completely negative. There is no question of charging. Once at T is equal to T2, they are equal. Right? And then at T is equal to T3, what happens? That difference becomes just better than video on or equal to video on. Right? Then once again, it will be charged up to this point. T2 and T3. And T2 at T is equal to T2, these two, these two graphs, this graph and this graph, these two lines, I mean they are. That is a common point. At t is equal to t2, these two values are same. So you have to ensure that this one should be greater than this one by one video. Right. So at t is equal to t2, they are both of them, both of them are same. And at t is equal to t3, now what happens? At this particular point, both of them are same. V is equal to Vk. And t, t is equal to t2 plus. VA increases and VK drops. VA increases and VK drops. So you are pretty sure that there will be some point when this difference is becoming your video and that thing happens at T is equal to T3. <coughs> okay. Once again the charging phenomenon will start and the charging will happen up to your the same VP minus video. Right. So we are to times this T3, yes, we are to times T2 is equal to T3. Sorry? We are to times T3, minus we are to times T2 is equal to T3. Ha. Right? But still you understand that there are, there are some ripples. <laughs> that is the scenario with a half wave rectification. Half wave rectification. Now just try to visualize what happens in the full wave rectification. I'm coming to that later on. Is there any doubt up to this? Any doubt? I'll erase all those uh, writing. Any doubt? No doubt. Fine. Now try to understand what happens or how to select the value of the capacitor. 
right? Now suppose I am having three different values for the capacity. Very small C1, small C1 or moderate C1 and large C1. Now up to this you know that that is the nature. Up to this that is the nature. Charge C. And obviously the value of C doesn't make any impact because the value of RT is very small so it will charge up to this point. After that, what was the expression? After that, the expression was something like that. The expression was this V out is equal to Vm e to the power minus E by RLC. So that can be represented as Vm 1 minus E by RLC plus T by RLC whole square by factorial 2 minus and dot dot. Right? Now, if I assume that my C1 C value is very small, that means what? C is small enough so that this RLC, that product, is now suppose it is comparable. Now the product is comparable. Now obviously that discharging will follow an exponential nature. You have to incorporate all those terms, square, 3, 4, all those higher terms you have to consider. Because this time C is very small. Capacitor is C to the chi. Now follow the normal curve. Now it is having no impact because there is a disconnection. Ah, very small C1. That means what? C1 is very small. Suppose you have taken some RL. C1 is very small. So that the product RL C1, that is suppose it is comparable. Comparable to T. Right. So therefore, you, you cannot just have this approximation that T by RLC is much much less than 1. It's not just possible. No, I'm just saying the, the, this one. This one. Very small C1. Very small C1. So T by RC, that product, I mean that thing, T by RC, now it is comparable. Comparable to unity. So obviously you have the square 3, 4, so all the higher terms will be there. Okay. So obviously it will follow this exponential variation, something like that. I mean the last year nine Very small C1, right? Now if you increase the C1 value from very small to small, right? We are increasing the capacitor value. That means what? R is fixed. We are increasing the capacitor value. That means what? The corresponding time constant gets increased. Very small to small means what? C value increases, so time constant increases. So when the time constant increases, that means what? You have more time for discharge. So now you don't have this exponential nature. Now since the corresponding C value increases, so this T by RLC can be now this value is uh, less with respect to unity because C increases. So RL is suppose same RL I am considering. So this T by RL see that particular thing is now suppose this is much much less than unity. So then these terms, the square, cube, so all these terms can be negative. Now we have a straight line like this. Right? Now if you further increase C, very large C, then obviously you understand that what about the slope? What about the slope? I am coming to that. The next slide, hopefully, that was that, that is this mathematical expression was there. I am coming to that. See, when if you further into C, right, then the corresponding discharging will be even less. Right. And remember that variation from here to here, that variation is basically the ripples. That variation. And remember, this has been shown with a half wave rectifier. Now try to understand the scenario of what happens in the full wave rectifier. As I have told you, as I have told you over here, 
or the half wave rectifier see the half wave rectifier at omega t is equal to pi by 2 or t is equal to t1 the discharging of capacitor takes place first and there is no provision for the capacitor to be charged one second in the next half cycle why not because you know that uh, your output i mean that is negative fine that is off but what happens if i use another diode in my circuit or another three diodes in my circuit either bridge rectifier or semiconductor transformer uh, fwr second half cycle in the second half cycle also you expect that that would i mean you should have another kind of thing over there I can have another diode over there, something like that, right? Yeah, so obviously in that case, what do you expect that this charging phenomenon will start right at the next half cycle? It should not wait after the third cycle, third half cycle. One second, you should expect that it is something like that. So from here to here, charging, discharging, then charging, discharging. So if it is a full wave rectifier, then the ripple is even less. Okay, ripple is even less. Hmm. Because one thing is very clear, although it's a linear, although it's a linear, but as time progresses, as time progresses, the corresponding discharging is also more. But if you allow the capacitor to charge right at the second half cycle, then obviously that discharging, I mean that, that amount, that ripple, that change is less. You have less ripple. Okay. Yes. So that is the expression you know, the VP minus VD on, that is the peak value that you know, e to the power minus P by RLC1. Right? Then, what about your V out T then? So already I have calculated that one, this e to the power minus T by RLC1 is nothing but 1 minus T by RLC1. Right? Then, VP minus VD on minus VP minus VD on into T by RLC1. Clear? Now, this part, VP minus VD on is your desired voltage level. And VP minus VD on uh, R, uh, into T by RLC1 is the corresponding change. This is the corresponding change. The reduction due to the discharge operation. Now, as T is more, as T is more, you have more discharge. Clear? So from that, you can find out the ripple content. So what is the ripple content? So like what is what is ripple content? Ripple content is so VP minus VD on is the peak value, and this is the reduced voltage as a function of T. Right. Now for the Half wave rectifier, you expect that the next charging uh, operation happens after one full cycle, almost, almost after one full cycle. So then, this T is nothing but what? Time period. Time period, input time period, almost, not exactly, but almost. So what about the ripple then? So the ripple content is given by, so the ripple content is given by VP minus VD on, VP minus VD on, by RL into T in by C1, almost, approximately. That is equal to this much. So, AP minus VD on by RL C1 to AP. 1 by T in is equal to AP. So, how can you reduce the ripple content? Because what is the ultimate objective? Your ultimate objective is the reduction of this ripple content. So, reductions of AP minus VD on, so that is a fixed quantity. So, you can reduce the ripple either by Increasing the RL, the load resistance, so the capacitor value, so that this RLC1, that particular product, this time constant, 
is more, this charging clamp constant is more, or by increasing the input frequency. Is it okay? Answer is If I have, suppose, let me just frame one question. Suppose all these parameters are same. You have the same diode, you have the same register, you have the same capacitor, right? Now, the same circuit is exposed to two different types of frequency. In one case, your frequency is say 50 hertz, in other case, your frequency is a 100 hertz. In which case, you can expect less frequency. 100 hertz. 100 hertz. Because you have more frequent variation. Same thing. Either you explain the same, either you explain this notion from the notion of your, uh, your half wave and full wave uh, So, method you can say that if my input frequency is large, so 50 hertz and 100 hertz, even for the same circuit, even for the half wave and even for the full wave rectifier, if the input frequency is more, that means the capacitor will take less time for discharge. So, the ripple content will be less. But still remember, ultimately what I expect after this, <laughs> something like that. I am not supposed, I am supposed to get a flat line. I am supposed to get a flat line at the output. But surprisingly, I am not getting that one. And that variation, so this is your, so this is your VP minus VT on, right? And this variation is your ripple. Okay, VP minus VT on, minus VR, once again up to VP minus VT on, then coming back to minus here, something like that. Clear? Yeah. So, I have to, once again, I have to eliminate that variation. That is not at all accepted. I have to eliminate that variation. And that variation can be, obviously, you should expect that this variation is not that from, say, 5 volt to, say, uh, 9 volt, something, not, something like that. It's not something like that. The variation should be small. This ripple variation should be small. Okay. And that variation can be taken care of by a special type of circuit, which is called a regulator circuit. And this regulator circuit involves Zener. Right. So we have started our journey with uh, half a rectifier, identified its limitations. From then, we have moved to the full wave rectifier, either using center tap transformer. We have seen the disadvantages, limitations of center tap transformer. Then we move to bridge rectifier. Using bridge rectifier, we have some fluctuations yet present. That can be eliminated by invoking a filter circuit. But still, using after filter circuit, we don't have a flat line. It can reduce the ripples to some extent. It reduces, so initially I have told you, na, there are certain uh, high frequency components that I have to eliminate. Basically, this particular thing, uh, this uh, RC uh, circuit, something like that, suppose this circuit, this circuit stands for a typical low cost filter. You have experiments uh, using this circuit in the next semester. Simulation based experiment in the computing lab. It's a low pass filter, right? So that low pass filter can eliminate those high frequency components. It can retain those low frequency components. But it's, it, it cannot retain only the zero frequency. Apart from zero frequency, it can also contain some non-zero frequency, some non-zero low frequency. So that's why you have these fluctuations. It has eliminated the, the high frequency components to some extent, but not exactly, not completely. Right? So that fluctuation, I would like to eliminate that, even that fluctuation. And this can be achieved by using a circuit which is known as a regulator circuit. And which involves an 
So the discussion in the next class will start from the regulator circuit. And hopefully you have the idea behind the generator. Right? You know how does it operate? Having this in mind, we will start our next discussion on the regulator circuit.